if you are inclined to look for a job, don't come. But if you are entrepreneurial minded, you have a skill set that you can share, technology that you can transfer. If you have a way to utilize the, the abundant raw materials that we have here, you know, we have an abundance of so many things that you can't easily find outside. And if you're able to create a business that utilizes what we have here and exports it for, you know, foreign exchange, that sort of thing, you could position yourself for a very positive life. Hello, my name is Melissa Mensa, and I am an attorney licensed in Washington, D.C. and Accra, Ghana, and I'm also an events professional. In childhood, I grew up in the Bronx, and at the time, the Bronx was very Jewish. So I speak multiple languages. I speak Hebrew, English, and Spanish are my main languages in life. And the way that I um, came to be trilingual is that um, as a young child in the Bronx, the, there was a large Jewish community. And one of the best schools in the area was um, a Hebrew school called the YWHA. And I think I might have been three or four years old at the time. And I, I think I was a bright little kid. And my teachers at the YWHA recommended that I attend the Hebrew school as my elementary school. So from first grade until sixth grade, I attended a school called Kinneret Day School in the Bronx. And at Kinneret Day School, we're ta taught half of the day in English and half of the day in Hebrew. So as a result, from a very young age, I learned to speak Hebrew. Additionally, in the Bronx, we had a very huge Latino community. So many people from the Bronx, whether formally or informally, we speak Spanish. In my case, I had um, a Berlitz Spanish book that on the weekends when I wasn't in regular school learning to speak Hebrew, I was self-teaching Spanish. So between childhood study and, you know, friends and family associations that spoke Spanish and also in university, studying Spanish formally is how I um, became trilingual. And I also lived and worked in, the, in Latin America. So yeah, that's where I became trilingual. I lived in Israel and studied Hebrew school and I've lived in Latin America and I've studied Spanish in school. The way that my childhood influenced my lifestyle today is pretty interesting in that I was born, you know, just after the civil rights movement. I was educated, um, like I said, raised in Harlem and the Bronx. So it was a a very interesting time in terms of the social things happening in Harlem and the Bronx. And I was a little African child growing up in New York, um, attending a Hebrew school with, you know, all white students. So I, I was I was an anomaly growing up and growing up in New York at that time with the, the background that I have and the kind of education that I was receiving. It was uh, it's helped to give me a, a pretty interesting perspective on the world. So my educational background, as I mentioned, it started out in a Hebrew school called Kinneret Day School in the Bronx. And as a teenager, well, for a year or so, I lived in Israel and I attended a school in Israel called Tabitha School, which is um, the Church of Scotland School in Israel. So I went to Hebrew school in New York and I went to Scottish school in Israel. After returning from Israel as a teenager, I came back and I attended school in Chicago, and then I attended a school called Source Academy, which was a very um, groundbreaking, very small college prep school uh, in Manhattan after um, our headmaster died. Um, Source Academy was a very groundbreaking, small college prep school. Um, so I studied there after I returned from living in Israel and running ar and living around the country, but with my mom. And ultimately, I studied at uh, Lehman College, City University of New York, Lehman College in the Bronx. And I graduated with a degree in political science from there. And then I studied at the Howard University School of Law and graduated with a Juris Doctorate um, of Law from there. And then after that, I studied at the Ghana School of Law, where I earned my post-call degree and to practice law here in Ghana. I made the decision to move to Ghana for a few reasons. I had um, two young children and they had been, they were being raised in America and I didn't want them to be overly Americanized. I wanted them to have a strong association with their African roots, their Ghanaian roots. So um, it was a plan of mine to structure my life in a way that 
as opposed to having to be in New York. You know, I have to be in America because my skid, my children are in school. I enrolled them in school so that I had to be in Ghana the majority of the time, and it became um, the center point of their life. So um, that was, it was always a desire of mine to raise my children, to live here in Ghana, to be much more comfortable, you know, living in Ghana than I was. I had to learn how to live here at um, an adult age. Some of the challenges that I faced when I relocated were, you know, understanding Ghanaian culture is very different from Western culture in ways that um, I hadn't anticipated. But um, I can say that I'm, I'm, I'm not disappointed at any of the challenges that I face. It just taught me to develop new skills to survive in an environment that doesn't have some of the safety nets that we have in the United States or culturally is very different from what I had been raised living in America, even though I always was associated with my Ghanaian um, identity. My most absolute favorite thing about living in Ghana is feeling at home, feeling um, free. The freedom that I feel as a Ghanaian woman, the protection under the law, the, the, the sense of um, familial connection that I have with Ghanaians across the board, irrespective of language or um, actual fa family ties. I feel much more connected to the people with whom I move about in the streets on a daily basis. So that, that's what I love the most about Ghana. My professional journey since I relocated. So I'll, I'll take a step back when, after I completed my law school in Ghana and I started practicing in the United States, I had taken the decision to come to Ghana and do the post call so that I would be licensed as an attorney here as well. And one of my classmates at law school in America is a gentleman named John Apia. John is actually a cousin of mine and we attended law school at Howard together. John and I came back together and we did the post call together. So we both are, we were licensed together in the US as well as licensed here in Ghana. And um, in the years in between coming and doing the post call to joining John in legal practice here today, I worked as managing solicitor in the Amate Fio and Co. Chambers, Ayawaso Chambers. I worked um, in-house as an attorney for Red Sea Housing Services, and I also held some other administrative positions with them in the interim. And in the intervening years, I was able to engage in a number of different projects that were very interesting. And I, I don't know that I would have had the same opportunities to explore different types of entrepreneurial activities as I have had here in Ghana. My first charitable activity, I believe, was the Infanta Malaria Prevention Foundation, which um, is an organization that was formed with women fighting against malaria. And I think from my experiences working with Infanta, it gave me the, um, the understanding of how to go about and make direct impact in communities. And uh, as a result, I have established a foundation called the Accra Premium Foundation, which um, is associated with our, we have an annual event that my children and I pr produce called the Accra Food Festival. And an aspect of that is a charity outreach where we go into different communities that might have been hit with a disaster or be otherwise underserved, and we distribute food to them just as a, just as a, a spontaneous treat for the community, for the children and the moms in the area. So most recently, um, we did an outreach to families impacted by the wage of flooding. We've had a situation where people have built within a waterway, and as a result, their homes are subject to flooding in instances where the wage of dam needs to reduce some to, to do spilling from the dam. So as a result, several thousand families were displaced, children were lost everything that they had, their homes were, were absolutely devastated. And the Accra Premium Foundation went out and surprised them with KFC one day after the Accra Food Festival. So um, like I said, I've had an opportunity to do quite a bit of charity work over the past 18 years that I've lived in Ghana. But this is the activity that we're doing these days, food distribution through the Accra Premium Foundation. My, my, I guess my biggest activities other than work would be roller skating and dancing. I, I enjoy kizomba dancing. So um, between walking, roller skating, and kizomba dancing is how I keep myself fit and active, and they're my favorite ha activities. In, as far as events go, I have had an opportunity to be in this space for probably 10 years now. 
and to watch the the system grow dramatically we produce some of the very popular events namely the Accra Food Festival is our flagship event but we've seen the the industry grow very nicely but I also enjoy the traditional festivals so um you can find me at Homowa activities the traditional activities lead up to Homowa I'm always there um to celebrate those things so I enjoy the the new style events but I also enjoy our um traditional events first event under Accra Premium started off as wine tasting events we partnered with the um, an Italian wine brand that was importing to Ghana and we started doing tasting events and we realized that we enjoyed um bringing food lovers drinks lovers together with good brands so that grew into an event called the Accra Food Festival which we've hosted now for 9 years and in the interim of the Accra Food Festival we have smaller special events including an event called the Embassy Chef Showcase where we invite the uh, ambassadors in town the last time we did it we had 18 ambassadors send their personal chefs into um the major hotel and we had like a grand bazaar where you could go and sample food from around the world you know very properly prepared on a very high standard these are the ambassadors that are sending their chefs in and it's a fun cultural exchange gastro diplomacy event that we host and we also host an event called the African Chef Tour where we invite prominent African chefs from around the world from Latin America from the United States from Europe other places in Africa to come and do a similar tasting event prepare um canapes from their respective cultures and connect with you know the the upscale food lovers here in Accra so in the event space we also have like parties like my children have a brand called the Day Party GH where they bring together like US style daytime party champagne in the afternoon in a very you know glamorous way so whatever it is that we miss in America whatever types of events that we look forward to seeing here in Ghana we've just taken the decision just to create them here and it's worked out very well My advice to diasporians considering coming back home, I've scarcely met anyone whether they're even African diasporians or even foreigners who come here who don't leave with a very deep sense of change, normally positive change and normally a desire to be here. And it's not easy if you are inclined to look for a job, don't come. But if you are entrepreneurial minded, you have skill set that you can share technology that you can transfer if you have a way to utilize the the abundant raw materials that we have here you know we have an abundance of so many things that you can't easily find outside and if you're able to create a business that utilizes what we have here and exports it for you know foreign exchange that sort of thing you could position yourself for a very positive life and for me as a black mother i I love America. I have always loved America, but at some point America stopped loving me and stopped loving my children and I could feel it in the um the policies and activities that were happening. So I I moved myself away from whatever perceived conveniences there are in America to, you know, protect us from the the very obvious ill. So it's a question of what's your priority. I my children's life is paramount to me. and um i would want them to be in an environment where they feel at home they feel welcome they feel protected by the laws and by you know the society so for me if those things are important to you and you're a black person still living in the diaspora don't be afraid to come and and figure out what you can do here because the the, the opportunities are limitless there's so little that we have here that there's an opportunity for you to come and create it if you are that way motivated. So, my advice would be take a visit, come home, look around, ask good questions, get good advice, and um I'm sure you'll be happy with the outcome. Am I happy with my decision to move back? Absolutely without question. Um and and I I don't hesitate when I complain about the daily things that we all complain about here in Ghana. The challenges affect me directly. <laughs> I don't have any secret nest of, you know, comfort. I'm in here hustling like everyone else and I'm still very happy to be here. And what would cause me to pack my bags and leave Ghana? I think if there was a failure of our our governance, like I think that we have a strong democracy, 
I feel that Ghanaian people are at their core fair people and they wouldn't allow our society to fall beyond a certain point. But in the event that our society were to collapse, that would be why I would leave. And I wouldn't leave permanently. I would only leave to regroup and come back because this is home. This is my family's home from centuries and I don't think I belong anywhere else. I've had successes in Ghana. I've had huge challenges. I've had huge successes. And um, what I expect, I mean, I'm in, I'm in my final, I say, 10 years of work. This final 10 years, I'm looking to be more bold than I ever was. I think I could have been even much more successful if I wasn't so intimidated and shy and afraid of what I can accomplish at this age that I've reached now and knowing that I'm closing in on my working years, I plan on doing um, quite a lot of very exciting things that I'm not going to say on this film today, but you will see and you will hear and you will know what I was talking about when it happens. Hi, this is Melissa Mensa. I'm an attorney and events producer in Accra, Ghana and you were watching Face to Face Africa, the premier global black voice.